Happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome back to the Lorden Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Really appreciate you stopping by here today. We're looking at a case that I've kind of kept tabs on in terms of news developments, but I haven't really shared anything with you guys on in a while. This is a case that actually reaches back to the first year of Brain Scratch. Really would have been a searchlight if searchlight was around back then. But that is the case of Maura Murray. Uh, I released it in two separate parts. If you do want to see those, we're going to have them in the description box down below. And we've got some special guests to come on today, help talk about some of the later developments that have happened primarily over the past year. Uh, really, in the last six months, we've had a few major ones, so I want to get their help on that. But just in case you're not familiar with this case, let's stop over at CBS Local and get a little update or kind of a recap on what it is. Maura Murray, a University of Massachusetts Amherst nursing student, has been missing for more than 17 years. As a matter of fact, in just a few weeks, we're going to hit the 18-year point. Back in 2004, she packed her car, lied to professors about a death in the family, and left campus. That night, on a rural road in the northern part of New Hampshire, the 21-year-old crashed her car. Then, she vanished. Investigators say there hasn't been a single credible sighting of her since minutes after her car spun into trees and a snowbank along Route 112 in North Haverhill just before 7.30 p.m. on February 9th, 2004. So what has happened since then? Quite a bit. Joining us now to help us go into the recent developments, a few guys that have been thinking and talking about this case a really long time. We've got Tim and Lance from the Missing Maura Murray podcast, uh, the Missing Podcast, the Crawl Space podcast. And quite honestly, Tim and Lance were some of my first exposure into true crime podcasting. Once I got started on YouTube and people told me about this case, I went looking for information and I bumped into you guys. How are you guys doing today? Doing great, John. Thanks for having us on. How are you doing? Really good, really good. Always good to spend time with with both you fellas. Uh, Lance, how's it going? Uh, how are the bees doing? Oh, they're uh, winterized, so hopefully they're going to make it through the uh, the harsh New Hampshire winter because we got them up in New Hampshire now. Thanks for asking, John. That's very kind of you. No, you got it. I, I know you care about those little fellas, and I, I hope they're doing well through the winter. We're going to have to talk more off offline because I, I want to hear about what winterized is, but... Oh, sure. For now, um, let's go ahead and just give the audience just a little background on when did you guys start Missing Maura Murray and kind of what was the motivation around it? Sure. Yeah, we started Missing Maura Murray, the podcast, in July of 2015. The uh, original intention was to explore the community who are obsessed with the, um, the case, the disappearance of Maura Murray. Um, and at that time, it was a bit of a smaller community, but still had a lot of the same um, aspects that we, you know, you can still explore today. There, there is a lot of trolling that happens. People wonder why um, you can dig into it real deep. Um, and uh, you know, you may not find any answers. Um, so that, I think that was originally our intention was kind of exploring the culture surrounding this case. And, you know, I know that people are used to true crime content, whether it's on, you know, Netflix or Hulu or, you know, YouTube, but back then it, it was, it wasn't such a big thing. And it was really fascinating to see people, uh, especially the people that contributed to James Renner's blog, because he had the most information on Maura's disappearance, uh, at that time. So you saw like people responding to blog posts and then people responding to those responses. And that was like incredibly fascinating because we weren't exposed to that yet. We weren't exposed to the true crime, uh, culture, the true crime phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you guys say that because that's a big part of what I was going through at the time with the Elisa Lamb information was the same kind of thing. It was like all of a sudden there was a place for people to have conversation about that, you know, and especially with that case that wasn't so steeped in paranormal or, you know, supernatural elements going on. Um, and it was really funny because I was thinking about this earlier today. I'm like, I think when I ran into Missing Maura Murray podcast, I think there was only six episodes because I remember being able to listen to all of them before I did that coverage. Uh, how many episodes are you guys at now? Somewhere 600. around 104. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think about 140, something like that. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah, it's it'd be a, a, a bit more of an uptake if I had to research all that before <laughs> talking about it on YouTube at this point. Um, all right, so on to Mora's case real quick. Uh, what is just one thing about it that sticks out in your mind in terms of kind of bothering you, either from the physical aspect of what's actually happening with the case or maybe the social component? What's what's the one thing that's really at you with this case, Tim? You and you and oh. your hardballs. Come on. One thing. <laughs> just one thing. 140 episodes later. I know. It. I know. it. Well, I want them to listen well, to the episode, so I can't we can't do the whole show here. But uh, Tim, what do you think? <laughs> Well, I do think the that social media in this case is sort of like an endless rabbit hole that you can uh, dive into and, and keep going forever. Um, again, I don't know that you're going to find any answers in there. But um, I think the car, you know, how, how Moore's car was left is an endless source of confusion for us and for uh, the people we have on and, and web sleuths in general. Yeah, Tim, uh have to agree. I actually uh, owned a Saturn at one point and part of the marketing at the time, and you would even hear this when you were going like through the purchase process was they would talk about all the safety features, particularly in the front end, and that a collision that would happen to the front of this car, uh, there was crumple zones built in to the engine compartment. The engine was made to break away and actually fall below the crash that's happening so it doesn't come into the actual driver's cabin uh looking at this and just for comparison this is from consumer reports this is a video just a still shot of their video of a test crash that they did into the same side they had just like this big concrete block that they ran this car into this car was only going 40 miles per hour and you can see what i'm talking about the crumples have taken where the car the front of the car is basically almost at the driver's cabin at, at this point. Uh, so knowing that, knowing that about the design of these cars, the first thing that screams out to me is this was not a very high speed collision. As a matter of fact, I even had to look up, did the airbags even go off? Cause it looks like this is right on the edge of the airbags, maybe not even being deployed. It looks like they were. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Just kind of looking back at this when I started seeing pictures, it just screams out like this. Plus, we know she, there's a witness, right, that sees her. So we know that she's not injured to the point where it was something obvious. Hey, lay down. Let me call 911. We're going to get an ambulance out here. A uh, lot, lot of concerns. How about it, Lance? What about for you? Well, I mean, the car, obviously, and some of the other components that go into the uh, accident itself. But uh, I think the the one thing that just bothers me the most about it is the years uh, subsequent to the accident, all the people that um that uh that conflate facts and and don't don't um correct them uh we talked about our 140 episodes and a lot of those episodes were us stating what was out there and then coming back and correcting our mistakes and trying to get the right information out there and over the years we've just met so many people who come into the into this disappearance and say I'm going to solve it I'm all about the family I'm all about getting justice for Mora and and that's not true at all. And they, they come in with all of these like, you know, guns blazing with all of these uh, early mistakes that should have been cleared up a while ago. And it's like the waters get muddied again and again and again. Then you spend more time trying to trying to, you know, suss through that and get out the, the correct information. And it's down to like even like the most minute detail about like anything that was in the car. If you're not going through the effort to to <laughs> to say like, oh, I got that wrong. I need to go and correct it. Then you, you're not serious about it. And you're not serious about being an advocate at all. If that's um, honestly how you're going to approach cold cases. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I ran into this quite a bit, uh, especially I think with cases that are close to us. Like, you know, we, we both have the big case. And actually, for a lot of creators, I kind of see that there's a big case that grabs their attention, they get very passionate about it, and then all of a sudden, people recognize that passion and they start growing an audience. Like, th there's there's a mechanism where that starts happening naturally. Then you have people coming after the fact, and I think there's something interesting in Mora's case that it does feel like it's something that someone could solve. You know, it's 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 kind of basic. And I think that's part of the allure. Like, I think with Gabby Petito, that was such a basic case. I mean, there, there is no surprises. There's no big turns that happened in that case. And the public just absolutely gravitated towards it. So I think there's an aspect to that with, with some of these cases. Um, but you're raising 
an important consideration I want to touch on real quick, because even with Mora's case, I knew that you guys were continuing your coverage. I didn't need to be the source of truth for that case and, and hash all these little individual details. I did an overall presentation, gave it to my audience at that point, uh, and then just kind of kept an eye out for bigger updates. And I think we have one of those today. It's why we're talking about this case here on the channel again. Is there a point, do you think, where you can cover something too much? Like, it, have you guys ever felt that? I mean, you're, t you're talking a lot of episodes on this case at this point. Some of those episodes, t exactly to what you're saying, Lance, you've got information that for the time, that's what was understood and correct. You know, Elisa Lamb, Hatch being on the water tank, we had the exact same type of situation. Later, we had better information, but now that older information is still out there. And people that aren't going to listen to all the episodes, they're just going to jump in and handpick the titles that they like. They might not get the whole picture. Uh, do you think there's some mechanism or, or just point of over coverage that's happening with this case? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think so. I think it's it's such a mysterious disappearance that I think it's still hard to kind of get the right facts out there. And I think depending on the source, sometimes those facts can even still change, um, as, as Lance was kind of talking about earlier. Um, but the, the police, you know, law enforcement has put out some some things recently, and even some of that is different from what we have known um, in the past. So back to the question, you know, wh what do you believe? Obviously, I think you believe the stuff that law enforcement puts out. If you ask some people in the community, they might not. If you ask the Mari family, they might not. I don't know. You know, it's a it's a real tough one. Yeah. And I think you can certainly overcover a disappearance or a cold case. Uh, and we found ourselves in that exact position over the past year or so. And that's why we started doing just the missing podcast. So there's missing Maura Murray. And we knew that we needed to take that uh, momentum and put it into other missing person cases. So, yeah. you know, we're working with the nonprofit PIs for the missing, private investigations for the missing, and cases of missing people come to us every single day, numerous cases, and we compile research on that, and then we present the research uh, over the, the missing podcast, I guess, airways. Um, so you do have to come to a, a decision-making point. Do you keep covering the same case, or do you put that case as the uh, the springboard, like set that that set that show up, set that case up as the springboard for for something more broad and something more uh, all encompassing. Yeah, and for the potential to do good, which is something I appreciate about you guys too. Not only do you work with private investigations for the, for the missing, you're on the board, you're you're volunteering, you're helping to spring to launch a platform really for them to help families directly, families that can't afford private investigators. So. Uh, yeah, I really, I really appreciate you guys um, for, for doing that. Um, so over the last year, the, there was a tree that was kind of recognized as a memorial spot for Mora's disappearance. People would go there, visit it. Blue ribbons were put up on that tree and trees around it pretty frequently. Seems like the property owners weren't happy with all of that attention. And now the tree has been cut down. Uh, we know the family has since asked for a historical marker on the highway. That request was initially denied. And the latest news on that is they're appealing the denial. In September of 2021, it was reported that bone fragments, human bone fragments, were found in the area, although I, I'm saying that loosely, it was about 25 miles away. How did that discovery happen and what was the outcome with that? That was a uh, discovery made on Loon Mountain that, yeah, as you noted, about 20, 25 miles away. It was a construction crew that um, unearthed some bones. Um, I think they were working on a gondola, some kind of real large uh, sort of, ep it was it the Kank 8, I think it's called. And an eight person gondola or, yeah. or something or a chairlift or something is going to be pretty impressive. But anyway, um, yeah, th they found these bones and they, they got the crime scene, um, investigators there right away and uh for several weeks it uh seemed like this 
is a very, very good possibility this is Maura Murray. There have long been rumors about her um, potentially going to Loon Mountain. Some of the suspects who we've never even identified, um, they're sort of coined as the Loon Three. Again, never even identified these people, but, um, you know, they have like a nickname. And uh, and and it was the mountain that these bones were found on and um, appears that the, the bones are not more as they're they're older than they, they were there before her crash. Um, so, yeah, it's it, it did seem like it for a moment. Some of the pieces seem to fall into place, but it is uh, apparently not more Murray. So, yeah, the- just to chime in there, it was. Um- it was tough because there have been other moments where there's been a dig. We've been a part of digs. There have been digs done by the family. There was uh, bones found uh, around like the Lincoln area, I believe, that caused a stir a couple of years ago. And this one was so different because, first of all, everyone was saying it felt different. The family was saying that it felt different. And there were all of these indicators that Loon was some sort of... Uh, location that 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 was uh significant in Moore's disappearance whether it was this elusive loon three or whatever they had done some construction there right around the time more disappeared so it seemed like so realistic that someone could have abducted her kept her for a while knew about the construction and then disposed of her body later on where they knew that it was going to be filled in by by concrete and probably not dug up ever and that just felt like that was the case but it, apparently it's not and we find out that the the bones dated back to get this for the range like 1770s i think it was 1774 or something mm-hmm. to like 1940 something like the range there is remarkable to me and uh, and i would have thought that they'd be able to better narrow that range down but it just goes to show you like i guess how deteriorated the uh the condition was but again it just seemed like it seemed like it was it it seemed like who else would be there right right Right. yeah yeah but unfortunately we're back at square one uh and then we get to a development that has happened over the past few weeks let's uh take a look at the screen here together yeah, I wanted to make a comment about the tree being cut down because I feel like that speaks to the people who live in that area who kind of got a bad rap and we're per- par- partially responsible for um not not per- not creating a bad rap for these people, but these are people that live in that area. They didn't have they didn't want this to happen to them and they're not cutting that tree down out of spite. They're cutting that tree down because it's on a sharp hairpin turn and people stop there to have dark tourism moments and it's dangerous and it is it was only a matter of time before somebody else um gets hit by a car or has an accident there or somebody parks their car walks and you know someone else is coming they see it they go off the road maybe even hit one of those homes there it's not a safe turn uh i get having a memorial for her and i get all that and and it's you know it means something to the family but it needs to be in a better location and i 100 percent support there being nothing there because it's only inviting another accident Gotcha. Yeah, that's, that's my rant on that. No, it's a it's a good consideration. Something I I wouldn't <laughs> have thought about. And yeah, um, I don't know why there would they would deny you know um, a mile marker memorial. You know, I, I think I, they just don't want people stopping and taking pictures on that hairpin turn. It's yeah. dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe they could figure out something else that uh, I don't know changes the location up a little bit or yeah yeah Yeah, it would you know it it is a weird thing like do you want to really celebrate the dark tourism of it i mean i think that there's one mile marker or historical marker in new hampshire um dedicated to the benny and barty hill um incident so you could say there's some precedent for the kind of dark tourism that we're talking about um but again like uh that spot is just not not really conducive to i mean there's no parking there you can't park anywhere yeah. in that area without it being a, an issue right right well let's get to the latest update over at wmur.com uh this is an article from january 17th as investigators continue searching for maura murray after she disappeared almost 18 years ago there are new developments the fbi has created a violent criminal apprehension profile for maura murray Uh, So some big questions already just off the name of that system. We're going to get more into that here in a moment. Uh, Here's a quote from her sister, Julie, saying it's a way for multiple agencies and different jurisdictions to share information. Uh, Of course, getting entered into a database where other law enforcement can access it 
uh, might be helpful for a case like this. If you have a tip that comes in somewhere else and it just doesn't get correlated properly to the name Maura Murray, um, might be helpful. But let's learn about this system. The system is called VICAP and it contains crime scene de descriptions, victim and offender descriptive data, uh, including name and other personal identifying information, lab reports, criminal history records, court records, news media references, crime scene photographs, and statements. The data consists of cases involving homicides, missing persons, unidentified dead, sexual assaults, and other criminal cases. Now, what is the reason for VICAP? Why do they collect all that information? The information is being collected to identify and match violent crime scene cases based upon characteristics, uh, MOs, etc. So this database is specifically for connecting violent offenders. And Mora's yeah. case is now being entered there. What What are your guys' feelings about that off the top of your head? Do you think that this is a case where there's a violent offender that's involved here? Um, I would say a pretty good chance, yeah. Violent crime apprehension program. And I do want to add... Uh, violent serial offenders right. so On yeah I think, highways right right specifically yeah so i think the the program was sort of put into place to i guess match you know and this is a bad probably example but like you know keys is victims sort of ma try to match those from a distance you know right. um missing persons cases and things like that um but i i do think it's interesting that this is now been entered and um I do, I do know there's a quote here from uh, senior assistant attorney general Jeffrey Strelzin, who said that uh, it's simply another investigative avenue being used in the case. He says, like all investigative avenues, the hope is that it may lead to useful info in the case. And that's from um, ManchesterIncLink.com. So he's, he's not really saying there's any reason necessarily other than we've kind of come to that point where we're going to try this. Um, again, I think the serial part is interesting. Maybe they just put every missing person's case in and if I, the time finally got got here or, you know, maybe they learned something else that led them in the direction where they thought this could be something serial that we're not aware of. Yeah, I want to I want to applaud uh, Strelzin for submitting. I'm not sure how Moore's case uh, was was taken into consideration for VICAP, but I just want to applaud him for being, I guess, one of the leaders that got her into that program. Um, it was started in 2009. And if you look at the data on it, they gave a good chunk of time to uh, assess its performance in like 2019. So 10 years of a uh, case sample, like 10 year, 10 year sample size, uh, they identified, um, not identified, but they, they've included uh, more than like 750 victims and identified more than 450 possible predators that are connected to those victims. So I think once once the numbers came in, it took time, like any case study takes time. And, and I think they needed to see this sort of in action. I know 10 years feels like a long time, but you're talking about... <laughs> I can't even imagine how many, what the condition of the, the victims, like of that 750, you know, what the process is to allocate uh, resources to identify how somebody died and then identify like the possible predators. So they have more than more than 50% of those victims have some connection to possible predators, which is which is really amazing. But that obviously takes time. My long-winded point is that I, I would like to believe that Strelzin was looking at this and saying, once we get significant data that'll make it worth it for me to submit more his name, I'm going to submit more his name. Like, you know, something like that. But either way, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, on the screen right now, we actually have the posting over at FBI.gov. Just want to run through this real quick because, of course, we're always trying to raise exposure help on these cases. And uh, let's just see the profile they've put together here. Effectively, there's a new type of uh, poster that is, you know, all this information is kind of loaded into. We can see it's a VICAP alert for a missing person from the FBI Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. Date of last contact, February 9th, 2004. Uh, location, last seen, Haverhill, New Hampshire. Uh, we're talking about a white female standing at five foot, seven inches tall, weighing between 120 to 125 pounds with green, blue eyes, light brown hair. She was 21 years old at the time of her disappearance. Distinguishing features, they're noting dimples on both cheeks, a scar above 
Uh, do you know? It looks like they're missing a word there. Namus states that it's a scar on her right calf. Um, and Fillings Crown's present. They have all the agency case information, the NCIC file number. Of course, I'll have that in the description box down below as well. And here's kind of their recap on the case. On Monday, February 9th, 2004, at approximately 7.30 p.m., a black colored Saturn four-door sedan vehicle belonging to 21-year-old Maura Murray traveled off Route 112 in Haverhill, New Hampshire, not North Hampshire, and became stuck. The roads in that area of Northern New Hampshire were snow covered at the time. Murray was not present at the crash scene when police arrived and has not been seen or heard from since. Murray was last seen on surveillance footage earlier in the day at an ATM wearing a dark jacket and jeans. Prior to that, Murray had left the University of Massachusetts Amherst where she was studying nursing. Murray did not share with others her pending trip to New Hampshire, which was about two and a half hours away. Murray received prior education at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, was an avid runner, and enjoyed hiking in the White Mountains. Also, this was an area where her family would vacation. She was familiar with this area as well, right, guys? Yeah, that's right. They had uh, definitely vacation there in the past. Okay. Uh, they've loaded a couple of photos up here. And then I think this stuff is probably going to be pretty much the same recap. Uh, yeah, it looks like they just collect this information and load it into the poster. So that is the official VICAP listing over at FBI.gov. A couple of things, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, now, it, up top, it says location last seen. It does say Haverhill, North or uh, New Hampshire. But down in the summary, it says that Mari was last seen on surveillance footage earlier in the day at an ATM wearing a dark jacket and jeans. That's Amherst, Massachusetts. So yeah. is that is that an inconsistency or I mean, I don't know. Yeah, um, I, I mean, we know that there was a witness, right, that saw her at the accident scene. Well, that's another thing I was going to bring up. They don't mention him. So they, yeah. they actually, you know, like I don't, they don't mention him in the summary, you know, Butch Atwood, the, the school bus driver. It's almost like they wrote the summary um, and kind of uh, bypassed his whole experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. Hmm. I wonder. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know what to make of that. Um, Would you know, there be any reason to doubt his information? Have well, you guys bumped into anything? Just that it's. I mean, just that it's one person's story, you know, one person's, I guess you'd say alibi or whatever for where they were at that moment. I mean, he's spoken to the news. He's spoken to a lot of people about it. He did uh, move to Florida before he passed away. So can't get any answers from him now about it. Um, but, you know, I, I always believed his story. I always believed um, it unfurled as he stated it did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously her using an ATM, they've got pictures of her or footage from there so they can say for certain that she was there. And yeah, maybe they're just, they're not including uh, a witness statement as part of the accounts there. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting thing to, to highlight. Hmm. Over at boston25news.com, a comment from her sister, Julie. I always wonder why it took this long to put it into this powerful, powerful database where information can be shared. I think Julie's touching on an interesting question there. Um, how long have you guys considered that there might be a, a violent offender that is part of this equation? Since, Since before we day. started the podcast. Yeah. That's yeah, what I, I mean. mean I would, yeah. 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 Day one, basically. Yeah. yeah. It's not a new development. So, uh, I think it is a, a kind of a big question. What was the trigger or what's the mechanism that has all of a sudden pushed it for, for it to happen now? Why didn't it happen years and years ago? Can I answer that with a with another question? Yeah. Um, like, wh why isn't Brianna Maitland in um, the VICAP program? You know, I've yeah. I've never seen. And actually, actually, I should confirm that she's not. But I but I assume I would have seen an alert because we've covered um, her case in maybe twenty twenty five episodes or, some, or something like that. Right. Um, she disappeared eighty miles from where Maura Murray disappeared from. Um, her car was left there. She was an age a few years younger than Maura Murray, but. You know, really similar circumstances. Where is her violent um, serial offender um, alert? You know, is is it because there's not information or is it just because, oh, again, law enforcement in Moore's case got to that point here because that's a checklist or something and Vermont hasn't gotten there yet? 
Yeah, I, that's a great question. I mean, if you were to look at both scenarios with both cars and say which one looks like a more of a violent um, situation, you'd go with Brianna's every day. It, it was backed up into a house. It was hung up. It could still run. She, you know, she's gone. She was taken from that car. She was not intending to back her car into a home. So, yeah, it is a really good question why more is is in it now. Also, a very good question why it took so long. They started in 2009. Who knows what the inner workings of this, you know, the FBI, uh, like how, how do they, how do they consider cases? Where do they start it? There's thousands and thousands of them, you know, and yeah. for a while they weren't even thinking that law enforcement is like on the mind, uh, on the not mindset, but there's a possibility that Mora went away voluntarily. There's a possibility of that. She's an adult and, you know, they had to take that into consideration, I guess. But yeah, great right. question. Great question yeah. on the question. To be honest, all, all it, it leads me to think that there was something that was recently uh, uncovered or discovered. Um, I yeah. guess it's a long way for me to give that opinion. It's a question also, you know, like uh, Brandon Lawson, like you, you've got the 911 yep. call. Guy says he's being chased, basically. Uh, a car left behind. I mean, just very similar as well. I don't know that he's not in Vicap once again, but it does. It does raise that question. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Morris' sister points out here, this database is used particularly in instances where foul play is suspected. So that is a big indicator to me, considering the state of New Hampshire has never classified Morris case as criminal. But this points in this direction that they have not ruled it out, which uh, I think she's making a really good point. Yeah, it confirmed Brianna's not in VICAP. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really weird. That is strange. Um. Julie makes another comment here. I hope it's because there's new information, but I think it's because law enforcement has exhausted all their sources that they have available. Um, yeah. And maybe it's just an FBI thing in, in comparing Mora's case with um, Brianna's. Maybe that's not really fair because I don't think there's any element of Brianna's disappearance where she might've crossed state lines or something, but Mora obviously did, you know, her, uh, trip, assuming she was there in New Hampshire, you know, she was in three different states. And so the FBI, maybe it's a little bit more natural for them to be involved and hit this checkpoint at this point. Well, right, and cause she physically was crossing those state lines. And, and from what I'm seeing in these articles, the office of the attorney general actually had to request that she was added to VICAP. So it seems like the mechanism is the FBI actually is identifying the case. I don't know if they're handling the actual data entry on their side as well, but they're the mechanism for getting it into VICAP. It doesn't seem like your local law enforcement uh, division has the ability. I know they can see it, but they probably don't have the ability to enter their own cases. And then even if they do, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually working with a detective right now. He sent in a paper that I'm going to be recording for a podcast episode soon, talking about the challenges with missing persons cases and He's very honest about the fact that you have many departments out here that are critically understaffed. So even getting that information, packaging it up, even if you've got one that you think, hey, this should be in VICAP, you know, this is right on a highway, This there was blood found at the scene, um, do they actually have the time in between balancing all the rest of their workload, working things that are active and, and in their face that moment to actually get that package off to the FBI and, and get them added? I don't know. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, again, maybe that that's a sign that um, New Hampshire State Police are still uh, working on this case um, and perhaps even diligently. I also wanted to notice that or note that um, at the bottom of the VICAP alert, it gives a Sergeant Matthew Kohler of the New Hampshire State Police. Um, it gives his his uh, phone number or at least the phone number to the cold case, but it, it mentions his name. And um, that is sort of a different contact that has been at the cold case unit um, working on Maura Murray's case. I don't know if that's an indication that Matthew Kohler um, is now in charge of Maura Murray's case. Um, but I, but that's at least new to us. Something to note. Yeah. Oh, well guys, that's <laughs> the latest. Um, Bobby Chacon just got back to me. <laughs> Yeah. FBI agent, former FBI agent Bobby Chacon, we had reached out to him to see if he had um, any information on VICAP and why this would happen. And as we spoke, he, he returned the email. 
what did he say? If you, if you know, we're going to talk to yeah. him about it, but did he give any answer? Or did he yeah. just try to set up Do you want me to do this time? on like as part of if, the show? Are we going to get the exclusive here? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Lance, <clears throat> he's a, he's a no reply all. So that, yeah, just I note noticed. that. <laughs> VICAP, as we call it, is a division of the FBI that was created to foster more communication across jurisdictions and to be a type of repository of unsolved crimes that might share certain elements in common, allowing investigators from different different jurisdictions to discover a similar pattern of crime or criminal behavior elsewhere and those investigators to keep in touch with each other. The case of the serial killer Samuel Little is the prototypical case of how effective VICAP can be. So that makes sense. An FBI analysis of VICAP noticed a crime pattern of cases in Texas and alerted the Texas investigators that a person in California was imprisoned for similar crimes. Um, And then he said in parentheses, he's oversimplifying it, but that's sort of the point. Um, And to get a true understanding of how VICAP and its work successfully uh, reads about their role in the little case is inspiring. Uh, The commonalities between cases vary and can look very different in each case. Uh, It can be anything from a typical weapon used or a unique wound pattern to realist uh, ritualistic markers and even staging. Um, He concludes by saying, I can't say because I don't know why or how Morris case was a candidate to be placed in VICAP, but he thinks it's a good sign. Um, So, yeah, it it answered the questions about like it's making all jurisdictions work together, looking for similarities, whether it's somebody who's in prison for that already um, and then connecting them to that particular crime that happened in that particular state and making sure that all investigators from all jurisdictions uh, communicate and work together. So it is a good sign. Excellent. Thank you, Bobby Chacon. Yeah. 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 And thank you guys Shout for Bobby. sharing that here. Um, yeah. Uh, bon- bonus information. We didn't know we were going to get. Really appreciate that. See, um, a little inter- th- those behind the scenes. A little peek behind the curtain, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, guys, in a few weeks, it's 18 years. Is there any particular step that you think is the next step? Is there some spot in this case that's the black box? that if you had some insight you think would would push it to the next level is there a particular person that you wish would talk what do you think moves this case forward i would like to see more people talk um you know i I think that's that's interesting i think i think there are there are still things that certainly aren't cleared up in the public's eye i don't know if they're cleared up um to law enforcement but there's a lot of questions that still remain that people close to the case can answer and uh it's it's discouraging that a lot of it hasn't come out at this point hopefully um it will come out soon yeah and i think this uh you know black box that you reference can start with something like this vicap program this this involvement of the fbi because somebody did something and they're still out there and you just I don't know the proper metaphor for it, but you 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 keep working at something. It's it's you know the the Andy Dufresne like working his rock hammer until he gets out of prison. Like keep working at it. It's the patience and consistency. Someone will say something. Someone will say something, knowing that the FBI is now looking into this. Uh, when when the loon bones, the bone fragments came up in in loon, someone was nervous. It didn't matter if that person knew whether or not that was Mora. Uh, if someone had harmed her and they knew and they know where she is, they still know that anything that's found up there goes right back to the conversation of Maura Murray. So somebody's nervous all the time and you can't operate like that. I know it's been 18 years and a lot of people will say, you know, they've gotten away with it so far. They're not going to say anything. But I'm, uh, I used to say that myself, but people break. It just takes time and pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to point out that... Um I, you know, I speak to a lot of families. I know you guys do too, uh, that are dealing with having missing loved ones. And, uh, from a few months in, they're talking about how painful and how long it seems that, you know, time just stops. It's all they can focus on. They can't sleep. You talk to them a year or two in and they just, it's like they, they, they don't know how to deal with it. This family has been dealing with this. It's going to be for 18 years at this point. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put out there, 
that our hearts are with Mora's family. And um, we truly hope that the answers are coming for for you guys very, very soon on this case. I hope this is the next step that really helps move things forward. Um, all right, guys, you're, uh, you've are you got three shows running right now, but really two are in active production. That would be Crawl Space and Missing. We've got links to all three of their shows in the description box down below. Uh, where else can people find you if they want to hang out with Tim and Lance? Heck yeah. You can find us on social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram, TikTok. Uh, we do these live shows every um, every other week on Tuesday nights. Um, they, they will stream to all the social media platforms. And do you have a place where all those links are? Do you have a like a central website? Oh, yeah. You can go to crawlspace-media.com. Super easy. Crawlspace-media.com. Excellent. And you can see the other shows that we sort of represent work with great great programs like la not so confidential and dialogue and um you know several programs so check it all out there yep all right you guys thank you so much really appreciate your time and thanks for stopping by thank you guys for watching please remember to share this with any friends or family you have in new hampshire i'd really appreciate it we want to keep eyes ears and hearts open and looking for mora I'll be back with a new mystery for you guys on Friday right here on the Lord and Arts channel.